This session is part of our 2020 virtual webinar series titled The Conversation Continues. ECLA is privileged to be presenting the 2020 conference from the city of Vancouver, which is located on the unceded territory, the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. We had an amazing program of speakers lined up for BCLA's 2020 annual in-person conference. And when we couldn't go ahead with that conference, we asked presenters if they would share virtually some of the fantastic ideas and work that they had prepared for the in-person conference. I'd like to thank all of those presenters who were able to commit the time and the effort to transforming their presenters into an online format. So today's session is being recorded uh, live with an audience. And because this session is being recorded, um, it, and it will be available through the BCLA website, we want to remind you that any questions or comments uh, in the chat window that are sent to all attendees will be captured on the recording. But if you have a technical question, best thing to do is send a message through chat and select panelists only. And then one of our staff in the background will be able to help you out. Um, when there are questions uh, for today's presenters, please add your question to chat and then select all for all panelists and presenters. And that way, everyone, including the panelists, will be able to see uh, what the question is. So now I'd like to welcome our panelists. Helen Brown, librarian in the UBC Woodward Science Library. Dr. Lisa Natham, associate professor at UBC's School of Information. David Budino, acquisitions and electronic resource librarian at the McPherson Library at the University of Victoria. Allison Richardson, e-resources and music librarian at KPU, and Sally Taylor, interim head of the Woodward Library and Biomed Biomedical Branch Library at the University of British Columbia. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to our panelists and uh, enjoy the session to all of you in the audience. And thank you again to our panelists today. Hi, this is Lisa, and I would just like to take a moment to build upon Annette's territorial acknowledgement. Helen, David, Allison, Sally, and I would also like to hold up our hands in appreciation and an acknowledgement to the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples who have been stewarding these territories and beyond the land and water since time immemorial, recognizing that the health of the territory is inseparable from the health of the people. We would also like to acknowledge that we all live in and are part of the systems that have created this climate crisis that we are all experiencing in different ways. We need to hold each other up and help each other gain access to reliable information to help us make better decisions. Learning from the words of Dr. Daniel Heath Justice, who is a Colorado born member of the Cherokee Nation and UBC faculty member, he asks us to hold each other up and hold each other accountable. For those of us who are guests on the territories where we live, work, and play, we ask you to consider what are the actionable steps that you can take with others towards being better guests on the territories where we live? Who is benefiting from our work and what are our responsibilities? Thank you. Thank you, Annette and Lisa. Um, my name is Sally and I'm moderating today's session and I thank you all for joining us for a discussion of the climate crisis and how we remain hopeful in a time of uncertainty. We have 75 minutes together with four individuals who are passionate about the issue of climate change. Helen Brown is going to start us off with a short presentation to ground us in the research and then we'll follow that with a question and answer period with the panelists. Um, I'll remind you of the logistics again later, but we encourage you to ask questions of the panelists 
um, using not the chat in this case, but the question and answer box. Um, and we'll try and incorporate your questions into the discussion. Some of you I know have been involved in actions yourselves. And so if you want to share any of those experiences with other participants, um, you can also use the Q&A box and we'll ask one or two people um, to speak to their experiences. Take care of yourself during the session. Um, get a cup of tea, use the bathroom, make sure your um, body is okay. And now I'll just ask um, all of us except for Helen to turn off our video and to mute our sound. Thank you very much. Um, it's very difficult to comprehend or process the scope and severity of the climate and extinction crisis, but we must. Um, as Greta Thunberg reminds us, to do otherwise than act is to give up everything, and that's far more than we have a right to. Youth are reminding us that we are not fulfilling our responsibilities. However, what they primarily want us to do is act in line with the science, which brings me to the science, which I will do my best with. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released their special report on 1.5 degrees of global warming in October 2018, and it gained a lot of attention. There have been many of these reports. Uh, this one looked at the difference between 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees of global heating. The overarching conclusion is that every bit of warming matters, every year matters, and every choice matters. One atmospheric scientist put it this way, one kilogram of carbon dioxide, about the amount that would be generating from driving seven kilometers in a mid-sized vehicle, can melt 650 kilograms of glacial ice. In other words, every action or inaction that we take has an impact, which is both daunting, but also hopeful. To help understand the data, I've included bars at the top and bottom of many of the slides with a data visualization from Show Your Stripes by climate scientist, Professor Ed Hawkins. These stripes represent changes in global annual temperatures from 1850 to 2019. The dark red bar on the far right represents 2019. This graph is from the IPCC report. The gray line shows where 1.5 degrees of warming is. The solid orange line angling upwards shows how our planet has heated so far, and the dotted orange line shows our trajectory. The faded colors represent options for what we have to do globally to stay within or to return to 1.5 degrees. At our current rate, we're likely to reach 1.5 degrees between 2030 and 2052. We're on track for three to four degrees of global heating within the lifetimes of those alive today, which would be catastrophic. In Canada, we're heating two to three times as quickly as the rest of the world. Even at the lowest emissions scenario, Canada is expected to heat by two degrees within 30 years. It's really hard to visualize numbers, um, so I'd like to try to ground some of these impacts in the place where I am. So in many parts of the world, these impacts are already devastating, but the impacts are accelerating everywhere. For the purpose of risk assessment and planning, many reports look at the impacts in 2050 or 2100, and that seems far away, but in 2050, my kids will be younger than I am now, and in 2100, they'll be in the early to mid 80s. I put these photos here for context that even the worst impacts that we're talking about, about will impact those alive today. They're not nearly as far off as we think. But I also included these photos because every month I take my family to Jericho Beach and we work there with others to remove invasive species and plant native species. We love it. My kids get really dirty and wet and we learn about the plants. We also enjoy playing there and having picnics. And I know that the land has a long history. I recently read an interview with Musqueam elder Larry Grant talking about the huge village that used to be in that area and the midden and burial sites that are still there. By the time my kids are 80, they'll have experienced one meter of sea level rise. And by the time they're my age, they'll have experienced half a meter and the Jericho Beach area will be inundated with its significant adaptations. By 2050, 13 square kilometers of land in Vancouver will be threatened by rising sea level water. And that doesn't include Richmond and Delta, which are at much higher risk. In Vancouver, the biggest impacts will be felt by the Musqueam community and reserve lands in the south, as well as the False Creek Flats where the new hospital is planned, and the land around Stanley Park and Coal Harbor. By 2050, 
the risk of wildfires will be even higher than it is today, and the health risks due to smoke will increase as air quality decreases. There'll be more rain in the winter and less in the summer. Plants, animals, and ecosystems will change, and we'll lose species that are less resistant to long dry spells like many of our trees. Glacier area is projected to decline 30 to 50% more than they already have by 2050, and as much as 70 to 95% by the end of the century. And that will threaten access to water, and it'll create risks to agriculture and hydroelectricity, and loss of species such as salmon. There'll be increases in vector-borne diseases like Lyme disease, and with these changes will come food insecurity, mental health impacts, and respiratory problems, as well as a loss of culture and a sense of stability. In addition to global heating, last spring, the UN International Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services warned that we're at risk to lose 1 million species in the next few years. They found that we've severely altered more than 75% of the Earth's land and 66% of the oceans and created more than 400 dead zones where nothing can live. The only positive thing that this crucial report found was that all around the world, lands and waters held and managed by Indigenous peoples are significantly healthier and more diverse. These impacts can and, felt be, can and will be felt at the same time, not necessarily one at a time. Also, our predictions so far have been quite conservative, and we're finding now that the risks will likely be even higher. In Canada, our emissions increased 15 megatons in 2018, not including land use, land loose changes, and forestry. 82% of our emissions come from the energy sector, primarily from the oil and gas industry and transportation. Increases in oil and gas production have actually more than consumed all of our efforts in every other sector. Per capita, Canada is one of the highest emitters. And I know we feel small, but we're not necessarily always small. A sustainable level of emissions is up to about 2.1 tons of carbon dioxide equivalents per person per year. Canada's per capita emissions were between 19.5 and 19.7 tons in 2018. This graph was published by Dr. Simon Donner, UBC researcher and a lead author on the upcoming IPCC 6 assessment report. It shows Canada's emissions since 1990 and the elimination of emissions needed from now onwards for each level of warming and allowing for sustainable development in other parts of the world. If all countries meet their reduction targets, we'll be on track for just over three degrees. To meet a target of two degrees of heating, Canada needs to reduce emissions by 67% by 2030. For 1.5, Canada needs to reduce by more than 95% by 2030. The pink lettering at the top shows where we will go with no policies. What I like about this graph is that it shows the impact of all the federal party election platforms from October 2019. And I find this useful because I'm one of those possibly strange people who actually read and follow policy platforms. And so this helps me to see and actually visualize what the decarbonization efforts involve. So where do we go? To quote Grand Chief Stuart Phillip, in the indigenous worldview, we believe that the land, the water, the environment is what sustains all life. We simply can't continue with rampant exploitation of the land because there are consequences, global warming, climate change. I absolutely believe that embracing indigenous people and indigenous values is going to serve all of us in the long run in terms of developing a sustainable approach to resource development, which we desperately need. And as the IPCC report on 1.5 degrees of warming states, well-being for all is at the core of an ecologically safe and socially just space for humanity, including health and housing, peace and justice, social equity, gender equality, and political voices. So we talk a lot about what we need to change or what we might lose, or mostly what we fear we might lose, but we don't talk nearly enough about what these changes could look like and what we might gain. We have the opportunity to decolonize our systems and create quiet neighborhoods filled with biodiversity and green space, better health, and more time spent with family and community. Also, right now we're in a place of transition. We have just done something much more difficult than eliminating emissions. And a recent ECOS poll reports that about 75% of Canadians polled expect that things will not return to pre-COVID-19 normal. And it's not that often that so many of us agree about anything, never mind something so significant. 
<clears throat> for the September 27th climate strike, I made a banner out of Storytime felt board scraps that reads, like the oceans, we rise. And I marched with 800,000 Canadians and over 7 million people from around the world. There's now substantial research from a variety of fields that acting and connecting with others helps us to cope. It improves our mental health and it's the only effective way to create the change that is needed. We have warmed by one degree and many impacts are certain, but at the same time, every decision that we make matters. What we do now and how quickly we act determines our future. So I'm done with my presentation for the moment, um, and we're going to move into questions and responses with our panelists. It will of necessity be a limited discussion, but we would really like to build more connections. And one way that we can do that is by joining the BCLA listserv, which you see here, and you'll also be able to find it in the chat. Um, this way we can connect, we can learn who among us is already doing this work, and we can share ideas and successes. You can open the link and sign up right now. I'm going to leave this up for a few more uh, seconds. Um, now is a good time to act, so, so please do open that up. It takes only just a moment to sign up for the, the listserv. And we will also follow up with a list of resources that we've mentioned or those we recommend. Thank you, Helen, for giving us um, that overview of the science and highlighting uh, the impacts that we're facing and the need for all of us to take action. We're going to now start with our panel. Um, during the discussion, I'll be asking the panelists questions related to hope and optimism, which we need, we need some of when we're dealing with this work. Um, what kind of actions we're taking in the library and what actions we're taking in the wider community. Um, just a reminder in terms of the logistics, you'll see there is a, a question and answer box. So I'd ask that you use that um, when you have questions for the panelists. And if you want to ask a question of a specific person, please um, put that into the question. That does have a thumbs up feature. So if you see a question that you would have liked to have asked and someone has already asked it, you can vote up that question and it'll um, float to the top of the list. We're also, as I said, really interested in people who have had some success with uh, climate initiatives in their organizations or in their community. And if you're willing to speak for a couple of minutes about that, to also let us know in the Q&A, um, and I'll ask for a couple of people to share their experiences. Uh, please use the chat feature for general comments and if you have questions um, around uh, technical support during the webinar. So I'm really happy that we have such um, an amazing group of people. And um, I think we want to hear a little bit from everyone about how they got involved in this work. So I'm going to start with you, Allison, to tell us what motivated you uh, with the climate action work you've been doing. Thank you. Um, I, I can say that I cared about uh, climate change since I first learned about it in grade four or five or something like that. Um, it just seemed really unfair and wrong that a couple of generations and one species could have such a big um, global wide impact on future generations and all the other things that are trying to share the planet with us. Um, but other than uh, reducing my trying to reduce my own carbon footprint, which I admit has waxed and waned at different stages of my life. I didn't really know how I could make a difference beyond that um, until the youth strike started happening. And then I felt this is a movement for everybody and I can help. Um, I live in Surrey and a friend and I felt that Surrey as the second largest city in BC kind of had an obligation to step up and, and, um, and do strikes as well. So we started organizing strikes and through that, and with the help of other people already in the movement, we started a community organization called Surrey for Future. And our big accomplishment to date was helping to lead the coalition of other environmental groups and public support for the city of Surrey's climate emergency declaration, which happened in November. And it, it, it is a symbolic declaration, but it did pave the way for Surrey to increase its ambition and speed on its other climate related and emission target goals. Thanks, Allison. And I'll ask you the qu same question, David. How did you get involved in this? 
Uh, well, I've been working with the Surfrider Foundation of Vancouver Island uh, doing beach cleanups. And uh, I started doing uh, some research with a colleague, colleague at UVic um, to look into plastic pellet pollution. Uh, we started finding them on the beaches around Vancouver Island and um, curiosity, I guess, is uh, what got me involved um, and continues to keep me going. But um, really, you know, when you start doing your own research and connecting the dots and talking to people and trying to solve a problem that's a lot bigger than any of us and, and you start collaborating with people. And um, I think, you know, building community has been really wonderful and, uh, you know, keeps me going um, and making the connections and, and, you know, leading in your, in my own right, just by being curious about the world and um, how it works and sharing that information with others and uh, holding other people up and, um, you know, su being supportive in whatever way I can. Thanks, David. And Lisa, I know you've been at this work for a while. So do you want to tell us what got you into it? Yeah. Thank you, Sally. Um, there, yes, I have been um, involved in work around uh, sustainability for a few decades now in my writing and my research, but it was about a year ago that um, a few things came together, uh, including the IPCC report that Helen just walked us through and some of the other things that Helen was discussing. Um, in reading that report, uh, I realized how conservative that report is and how it really struck me how bad the situation is. Like I knew it was bad, but to see it in that way and in that form, and that, that report is formed through scientific consensus, which is an incredibly conservative process. Um, so it was through that that I started um, protesting <laughs> by myself over at, on campus at UBC with a sign and standing in front of the building, the Kerner, Everyone from UBC knows where Kerner <laughs> Library is in the upper floors is where <clears throat> President Ono has his office suite. Um, so we were, there's a group of us that started um, coming together on Fridays to have these moments of, you know, holding up signs. And, and what really struck me more than anything is that I felt up until that point quite alone in the work that I was doing. And then by doing that and stepping out, um, because I just couldn't stand not doing anything more on campus in direct action, I was just blown away by the folks I met, such as Sally and Helen. <laughs> and that's how I, I think ended up on this panel is just, and that has given me so much hope and strength. So even though I've been doing this work for a long time, I no longer feel so alone in my workplace, which is incredibly powerful. Thank you, Lisa. And Helen, to you, um, I know I've asked you before about whether your children was the motivation and uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit more. Um, actually, no. <laughs> so, I mean, many people have asked me that, but I, I've always been concerned about the environment and, and the climate crisis as far back as I can remember. Um, but I focused on trying to minimize my impact, donating, attending, attending large demonstrations, um, and like I said, being really attentive to political party platforms. Um, but I, I really didn't know how to become more involved. I didn't see the pathways or the connections to get more involved. And uh, when I read the IPCC special report on 1.5 degrees, uh, and then followed that up by reading as many of the other reports as I could, like the Canada's Changing Climate Report, it really propelled me into action. Um, and it co coincided with me figuring out how to connect with organizations and individuals wanting to act via social media. And I think one of the first ones that I found was the Friday for Futures. And, um, but that kind of, that led me to others like Our Time and, and quite a few others. And so meeting those people and learning from them has been game changing. Um, so reading the reports gave me the push uh, to put all of my energy into this and, and overcome my fears about talking about it and putting myself out there and making mistakes. Uh, and those connections really helped me to find ways to contribute. Um, but for me, it's mostly about caring for others in the world that I'm a part of and, and just wanting to fulfill my responsibilities. And I would care about those things even if I didn't have little kids, though mm -hmm. I suspect I'd be far less sleep deprived and probably a lot more <laughs> effective. <laughs> uh, but I'm working with what I have and um, having little kids though, it does add some pain to it. Thank you. Um, 
so all of our speakers talked about um, what started them and I, I like I think everyone made the um, recognize the importance of connections with people. Uh, we have a few questions around hope and optimism. And so Alison, I'll start with you um, and ask you what hope looks like for you. Um, hope for me definitely looks like people working together uh, for climate with a focus on justice and pushing for solutions to be implemented. So I take a lot of comfort in the fact that like many of the world's smartest people are working really, really hard on fine tuning the solutions. And the scientists say, we have the solutions. The problem is that they're not being implemented. That's a political problem. Um, they're not being funded and implemented. Um, so, that's, so that's what hope looks like for me. And the youth are pushing for this. They kind of <laughs> brought the issue to the fore over the last year. And I, I have heard a lot of adults say like, oh, the youth will save us, but we can't, we can't wait for that. We have to help them. Um, a lot of the people that are organizing the strikes can't vote yet, much less run for public office. So by the time that they're you know, in positions with enough power to, to make these decisions for these changes, our window of opportunity to avoid the worst will either be over or be even more minuscule than it is right now. So we, we all, like us, right here and right now, we have to get to work on doing that. So, you know, I'm not a scientist, I'm not an economist. What can I do? Well, I can help bring about that political change. I can um, help to create that climate where politicians feel the pressure and know that people want them to act on this. Um, voting is not enough. We, only have elections every four years. Yes, absolutely, we have to vote for climate champions, but we need to work with the people that are in power right now and give them the courage to stand up to the interests that profit from the status quo. Mm -hmm. um, just one last little thing. Um, my favorite quote about hope as it relates to climate is from Suzanne Moser. And she says, we have very little hope literacy in this country and in the world, actually. There are many different flavors of hope. So we can't have this kind of hope where someone magically comes and fixes it like the youth or <laughs> some scientific mm -hmm. invention. We need to tap into that part of ourselves where we keep going despite the pushback, uh, where we can find hope and create it um, ourselves by doing the work and then also imagining the wonderful future that we can create as, as we're doing this. Thanks. Thanks, Allison. And Helen, what about for you? What does hope look like? Oh, well, I, I mean, I agree with what Allison just said. Um, there's been so many people who've been carrying this burden for so long, um, and many peoples who've been carrying this burden for so long, and um, and we don't have the option not to act. Uh, I'm, I'm reminded of that Greta Thunberg quote because she's so very succinct. Um, mm -hmm. I don't want you to be hopeful. I want you to panic. Uh, mm -hmm. And I find that useful not because I want people to panic. I, I don't. Um, and I, but I feel like actually understanding the scope and severity of the problem does involve processing some fear and grief and that the work of processing is important, assuming that we're in a place and have the capacity for that and not everybody does. Uh, mm -hmm. but without that, I think there's sometimes a tendency to be hopeful or optimistic or to believe in a fantasy that things will be okay or that someone else will take care of it, as Allison said, mm -hmm. or that our society and the way that it's structured and the economies of eternal growth and exploitation are functioning and can continue. So I guess for me, um, hope is not really hope. I, I don't really find that as a useful concept in that way. It's, it's more like just engaging with our reality and, and working and getting that work done. Um, it's not really optimism either, but just realizing that the work needs to happen and trying my very best to be a, a good citizen, a good ally, a good parent, even when I know I'm going to make mistakes. Um, but one thing that I've found is that community and acting with others is wonderful. It's, it's so much better than misplaced optimism. And there's all of these other wonderful side effects that I hadn't even considered. And so doing this has just been mm -hmm. this process of finding all these wonderful surprises. Thank you. Um, Lisa, maybe going to you now. Um, where do you find the courage to engage in this work? Well, if I build on the example that I was just talking about, which is um, taking a banner and going out and standing on campus where there's all of these, you know, 
uh, undergraduates, um, faculty members, librarians, everyone's passing and there, um, that made me nervous. Uh, and um, I think it's at the same time, what gave me the courage to keep doing it was the responses that I got. So a lot of people um, didn't want to engage and they avert their eyes. And then they're, if they did, or if I was able to get them to have a conversation, um, and it was really, yeah, it was, it was such an interesting process, but in those conversations, I got more hope or, or more um, examples of what people are doing and what is concerning to them about the climate crisis, because it's not like people don't know, right? Mm -hmm. They just, some of them would say, look, I can't talk about that. It's too upsetting. But others would outline the things that they're following, the things that they're doing. So that going back to both um, Helen and Allison's contributions, you know, talking with others and meeting with others, I can't overstate how much that filled my heart. And then I was able to go back to work and keep doing the things that I'm doing in this space, but with all of these examples of the different ways that people are trying to take steps. Um, mm -hmm. and, and some of those were um, quite personal steps that they were taking, some were professional, so teachers, instructors talking about how they're incorporating more um, voices from indigenous scholars and activists into their classes, because it's not like people haven't been talking about this for a really long time, but mm -hmm. who's been talking and who have we been listening to? Um, so that, that it was both what made me scared and, and nervous was also what was giving me the, the, what I needed to keep trying. Yeah, it was a little lonely at first, but it was great to see the people who rallied around and yeah, made those connections. Um, Allison, I know you've done some things that maybe made you nervous in this work. Can you tell us about one of those? I can say that everything makes me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> but I force myself to do it anyway. Um, let's see. Um, one, one thing that gives me courage is the desire to be as little complicit as possible in the climate crisis. Like, I, I don't want this on my conscience. I don't want this really bad stuff that's going to happen on my conscience. So I recognize that I live within the system that we all have and the choices I realistically have are what's available. So I make the best choices that I can and then I push to change the system. Mm -hmm. And then I want to say also, like reiterate what Helen, I'm sorry, what Lisa said and Helen said too. Um, other people, um, it, it just, when, when I would wake up in the morning during the climate emergency campaign and I would be so overwhelmed with all the stuff that I had to do and nervous about, you know, meeting with the city councilor or this or that, um, I would see things that other people would step up, well, I'll come to that meeting with you. Or I would see an email that someone wrote to mayor and council and they copied me on and all those things, knowing that other people thought it was really important too and cared so much gave me courage to keep going on. So just flipping that around saying, even if you're not in a place where you feel like you can take on a big role or a leadership mm -hmm. role, you, every single tiny little thing that you can do gives courage to the other people that are struggling because it's always a struggle to, to take on some of those larger pieces and, and push forward. Yeah, thank you. Um, Helen, we have this pandemic that's going on. And so um, despite the difficulties and the impact, do you see any changes that have the potential to help us with the climate crisis? Yeah, um, I've been, I have been talking about this a lot with, uh, with different people. Um, it's, I mean, the pandemic is, is so incredibly difficult for so many people, um, but there have been changes, right? Like we've, we've made some really significant changes. And I think some of the, the big things are, we've, um, we've really had to assess what our priorities are. And we've focused so intensely on family and community and health and fairness. Um, we've also realized that we can change and that there are things that are worth changing for and we've changed very, very quickly and in ways that are actually really difficult for social beings and are much more difficult than the changes we need to make to mitigate the climate crisis. Um, so I think those are the big shifts mm -hmm. that I see. 
and I, and I think we've also realized that we can change things like where we work and how we commute and that we can generally do without air travel and enjoy the places mm -hmm. where we are. Mm -hmm. um, also that we can, you know, rebuild and change our economy um, and things like local food production, how important that is and shorten supply change, uh, chains rather. And that we can have a more equitable society that that equality and health and housing and all those social determinants of health um, and the things that make us strong are, are just they're fundamental to our prosperity as a society. Um, I, I think we've also realized just how fast things can change when the political will is there. I think we've been told mm -hmm. for a long time that change has to happen extremely slowly, um, even in the face of a really enormous threat. And as it turns out, I don't think that that's really the case. Um, and I think also we've developed some skills in video conferencing and baking and gardening that will come in handy. So I suppose those are some of the things that, that come and come to mind. Right. Yeah, certainly we, we mobilized f fairly quickly, right, with the pandemic. And it would be nice to see some of that translate into the climate work that everyone's doing. Um, let's take a look here. Now, we have a little bit of time for some questions around hope and optimism from uh, the participants. And um, we have one question. Uh, and actually, it's related to concrete measures around what libraries and universities are doing to reduce their carbon footprint. So that's going to um, segue nicely into our next section because we have some questions for our panelists about that. I also just want to point out um, there was a little uh, glitch with the, the climate crisis list. So um, someone has, uh, let me just read this. Um, the link to describe manually doesn't work, but if you subscribe by, via the online form at the top of the page, that will work. So, because um, we want make, to make sure people join us on that list. So maybe then we'll move on to our next section. And um, we're going to first focus on questions around initiatives in the workplace and in the libraries, and then follow that with questions around things we're doing in the community. So again, if you have questions uh, for panelists, please share those in the uh, Q&A. So um, Helen, I'll start with you with this question, and that's to tell us a little bit about what UBC Library has been up to um, related to climate action. Okay, um, I, I think I can speak maybe a little bit about what I've done that might be kind of tied into work or to my role mm -hmm. as a librarian. And then um, I do have a list uh, from some actions that have been happening at UBC Library as well. Uh, so. I mean, personally, I've just been trying to raise the climate crisis in our conversations and in our decision making. Uh, I did write an article in BCLA Perspectives about professional development, travel, and conferences. Uh, and in early March, I also participated in a climate episode of the Book Club for Masochists, which is a reader's advisory podcast, which they, they let me join for an, an episode. Um, I've also been assessing air attendee, um, sorry, air travel uh, emissions for professional associations conferences, uh, just for attendees. Uh, and I was hoping to present that this month, but hopefully it will come soon. So I was trying to see what the impact of some of our professional travel is in some really mm -hmm. real examples of conferences that I've actually attended. And last summer, I did reach out to librarians that I'd seen at demonstrations, and we started to meet up and see what we could do to support the climate strikes. And we ended up connecting with the students and faculty from other departments at UBC. And we started a library climate action team. And then I've been on parental leave, uh, but since then the, the climate action team has worked on three main areas. And, and Sally's very involved with this climate action team, so this <laughs> won't be a surprise to, to Sally at all. Um, but it's climate research, collections, and air travel. And they have said that I can share some of the information about these projects, even though I wasn't involved in them. But let's see here, they include a couple of presentations. So um, a researcher who was working on air travel related emissions and faculty professional development at UBC. There's been a, a lot of work at UBC and they've even got a, a website called uh, Zero Emission University and there's a pledge and many librarians have signed that pledge. And so uh, there was a, a session about that at the library. And there was an amazing looking grant funded multidisciplinary panel, which was unfortunately canceled just in the last couple months. Um, but that was a, a really interesting presentation that I think would have been lovely. 
And I think the collections team is also working on reducing emissions and resource use um, through using reusable book truck covers, um, reducing in-person vendor meetings and swag, and looking into the carbon footprint of print and electronic books. And the air travel team is working on a decision tree for considering in-person conference travel and, and different travel options. And they've been working with um, different groups like the faculty association and professional associations to, to kind of um, increase virtual conferences and build that into our activities. So those are the things that, that I have listed. Um, I don't know if there's anything mm -hmm. else that I've missed. I hope not. No, that's a great summary of the work that we're trying to do. And it feels very slow, um, but uh, there's quite a few people involved. And so hopefully we'll be able to, to make some changes. Um, David, I know you've been doing a lot at the University of Victoria Libraries. Um, and I think that fits with one of our panelists' questions around reducing um, the carbon footprint. Uh, yes, so um, the past couple of years, University of Victoria Libraries uh, has been doing some visioning exercises to kind of imagine uh, what the future of our library and our campus is going to be like. Uh, and that's been done with librarians and staff. Um, and one of the things that came out of that discussion was, uh, what are we doing about the climate crisis? And what can we do as an institution? And um, at the University of Victoria Gustafson School of Business for the past five years, they've been uh, doing a study of their carbon emissions. And uh, so we decided, well, that's a first step. Like we don't know what the baseline is of the library, what kind of emissions um, are we can, you know, producing every year uh, out of the facilities, out of staff travel, out of um, the materials we use, shipping uh, and commuting uh, to and from work. Uh, so we contracted with uh, Synergy uh, enterprises and uh, they're a, uh, a firm here in Victoria that uh, they crunch the numbers basically and um, they have scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. Scope one are the direct emissions that you're creating. So natural gas uh, is by far our largest contributor to uh, greenhouse gases. Um, then there's electricity. Now electricity can sometimes be scope one or two. Here in BC it's mostly scope two because uh, it's hydro, but uh, in other provinces where you have more coal-fired uh, electricity, uh, those would be more scope one. Um, so our electricity use is, uh, is already kind of offset already by the university. Um, and so that's not as much a concern. Um, travel uh, and commuting is pretty big. Um, you can see on the chart there uh, about a third of our emissions and we can make some changes there. Um, and this past year or, you know, past couple of months um, has really proved that uh, we're going to see huge drops in our air travel uh, and commuting emissions. Uh, so it'll be interesting to calculate those in the next year. Um, another thing that uh, we're looking at doing is actually offsetting, uh, like paying for offsets um, of our emissions. Um, we can do this um, by buying offsets or, or um, I know Gustafson School of Business has surveyed their staff and students on uh, local projects or um, international projects to try to um, put funds towards uh, offsetting their emissions for the year. Um, since the university is offsetting some of our emissions, um, it was uh, determined that we only have to offset um, like 170 uh, tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, um, 170 tons. Yeah. yeah, so um, we don't actually have to, um, you know, purchase offsets for the full amount. It's been interesting doing um, this this project. Um, one thing that I can recommend that if your institution is thinking of doing this is to be very clear from the start of how you're going to be using this information and who's going to be viewing the information. 
Um, we sent out some surveys. Um, we did not get full buy-in from all of the staff uh, to fill out the survey. Obviously, the more people that, that uh, fill out the survey, the better your data is going to be. Um, but um, we found that we were kind of surprised that some people um, have some guilt in the way they commute or feel some shame and they don't necessarily want to report that. Um, some people feel shame about their climate impact. Um, and we were just trying to collect the data with no judgment, um, with the end goal of being that we would actually offset those emissions uh, a positive. Um, so I'll leave it there. And if there's any questions mm -hmm. uh, later that come up, I'm happy to address them. But I do want to point out that um, you can read our full report um, yourself uh, that was produced by Synergy that goes into much more detail on all the different types of emissions uh, at liveguides.uvic.ca slash footprint. Um, and I'll be sharing that in the chat as well so that you have that link. Thanks, David. I know um, I know our climate group at UBC, we keep going, can't we do something like UVic has done? So, <laughs> so definitely a leader in measuring the, the impact that the library has. Um, Lisa, maybe I can uh, turn the questions to you now and just, um, we had a question around what actions have been successful so far, but actually one of our participants also asked, um, how you get administration to buy in. And I don't know if you're willing to try and take that question on. <laughs> um, absolutely, thanks. Thank you, Sally. Uh, though at UBC, I think um, the administration was um, both at different levels, uh, was moved in a successful way towards st taking steps um, through our unit, the, the School of Information. Um, the, there was a lot of interest when um, I started moving outside and people would see me going with the banners, it generated some conversations and the school moved forward with a climate emergency statement. Concurrently, UBC came out in um, last December 2019 with a climate emergency statement. And I, there were many different, there's different groups on campus pushing for that. Um, but I do think that the Extinction Rebellion group, um, primarily students who started doing die-ins up in President Ono's office, mm -hmm. um, I think that helped. <laughs> yeah. but, but there were others doing work and who had been doing work for a long time. But I think those statements then give others something to push on, just like Helen was talking before about her interest in policy. Policy can be used. You like point to this policy. We say this. We said this a climate emergency. Mm -hmm. So how is the climate emergency discussed in all of our classes? Um, how do we connect the climate emergency and systemic racism? Because they are intertwined. These are not separate issues. Um, there are economic forces, like my, in my opinion, opinion, um, it's so tied into the way that we are enacting capitalism and the way that the economics um, is always talked about as the bottom line, as though that is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. I think librarians are used to like, we set that at the um, conversation over here. It is not the most important thing. Mm -hmm. There are other things that are important in life. And those climate emergency statements say those things that are also important to us um, beyond uh, the accumulation of wealth and um, increasing uh, profits and growth. So these very much uh, problematic assumptions that are built into some of our uh, democracies around the world. And mm -hmm. anyway, I'll stop there. But what I Thank have you. found successful is some of those um, changes within the policy framework that help others push forward the work that they want to do in various ways because mm -hmm. then you can hold the institution accountable because they have said those things are important right and very publicly yeah yes thanks lisa um, i'm going to switch tax a little bit around um, libraries and uh, librarians of course play a role in countering misinformation in call all kinds of areas, but specifically related to the climate crisis. David, what, what roles could librarians be playing or are playing in this area? 
Well, I think uh, if you go back to the kind of roots of librarianship, it's uh, evaluating information sources and, um, you know, uh, promoting good research and having solid resources available to our communities. Um, but I think it's, uh, you know, very telling what isn't in our collections. I think that's important to do um, solid collections work and start to represent voices that are not represented uh, in our collections. Mm -hmm. And then also work closely with our communities. I mean, I know we're already doing a lot of that work, um, but um, when, it, when it comes to misinformation, it's and kind of the spin, the, the, the kind of weaponization of, of information. Um, a lot of librarians tr uh, like to say, well, we're trying to be neutral and just serve our patrons. But um, I think we're finding that, you know, we are in a political um, world and our mm -hmm. actions or inactions can be political or viewed politically. Um, and so, you know, I think it goes back to having a good mission statement. Like, why are we there? What is our mission as an institution? Start there. And, um, and also when there's, uh, you know, the loud outbursts of misinformation, how do we counter that? I think we have a lot of tools at our disposal and a lot of, uh, experience. Uh, it's just, how do we, how do we do that? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And Allison, I know you've been thinking about this question too, so maybe we'll tap on you for some insight. Thank you. I just want to reaffirm that I think that teaching information literacy is really powerful climate action. Um, some of the things that are standard in information literacy and library research skills classes, uh, for example, like delving into the peer review process can really help people when they encounter climate denial kind of information or misinformation online. And they can actually lead to really great moments of student engagement. So going back to the peer review thing, that's a very common, you know, saying that the peer review process is biased and therefore all scientific papers dealing with the climate issues are totally biased is a common thing that climate denial people will put out, put out there. So, um, for example, one time I had a, a great moment in one of my classes where a student said, um, I watched this video on YouTube that said that the peer review process is totally biased. You know, what do you think about that? So we, we talked through all the stages and we talked through, you know, there, I admitted, you know, there are places where problems can pop up. It's not a perfect system. And then we went through the steps and, um, looked at, you know, this is a place where something could be problematic, or this is a place. But then we also considered the alternative, which is what if there was no peer review process at all? And I feel mm. like they, they, they actually were really engaged. And that one particular student who asked the question, I felt like, you know, from, from watching his responses, he felt like he, he learned something and um, kind of got a wider perspective. And I think as a conclusion, uh, like as a class, we kind of came together at the end of that discussion, kind of concluding that there is a lot of value in the peer review process and it adds to the to the accuracy. And I'm not sure, sorry, I didn't, I don't remember if I mentioned also taking a look at what would it look like if there was no uh, peer review process in place um, too was, was an important part of that discussion. And then I also think in that, you know, in this hyper socially networked world governed by platform algorithms, we should consider expanding our teaching and touching on things like how misinformation is spread and reinforced by um, paid political trolls and how bots amplify misinformation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, David, you touched on that too. And this is an area that I'm just learning about, but I know that those tactics were used kind of very effectively to, uh, during the Australian fires to kind of obscure the connection in the minds of the general public, maybe that the fires were, they were more about arson than they were about climate, right? There, there was a ton of bot and um, troll kind of activity kind of pushing that idea to kind of cloud over um, the real connection with the climate crisis. Um, 
there are people that go into battle every day on these platforms to call out this kind of activity and um, provide uh, factual information instead. And I think it would be fascinating to have it be a CLA session from some of those folks next year to kind of learn from them. Um, but also, finally, I want to say, like, let's draw some anger from the misinformation and let us motivate it. Let it motivate us. Mm. Like, we work in libraries. We care about information a lot. <laughs> and <laughs> a really important thing in my heart is that misinformation is such a polite term. Um, you know, we know right. Right. that these are lies. Uh, the fossil fuel industry, unknown other actors are paying people to lie for them. Um, and it's subverting the political process. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, um, prolonging all the injustice associated with, with the climate crisis. So like, let's call it what it is. Um, you know, tobacco created the playbook and the fossil fuel industry perfected it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it makes me mad. <laughs> and so I use that anger as motivation to push back and fight for, for climate justice. Thanks, Allison. <laughs> Um, we've had a couple of questions. Um, we're we're going to move now more into some of the community actions, but we've we've probably seen we've got questions um, regarding um, talking about populations that are most heavily impacted and ensuring those voices are represented in the climate action movement, um, as well as in light of what's currently going on in Canada and the U.S. related to Black Lives Matter. Can you speak about the relationship? between systemic racism and environmental impacts. So we, we also had, had thought of a question thinking about um, the COVID pandemic and climate crisis being threat multipliers that impact vulnerable communities. So um, sort of thinking of all of those questions put together, maybe Helen, could I start with you um, and what we can do to further equality and justice and make sure we strengthen those communities? Yeah, um, all, all of these are connected. Uh, we need to change our systems, the systems that we're part of, that our libraries are a part of, uh, not just because it's impossible to eliminate emissions solely through individual action, but because the systems are exploitative in more than one way. Uh, we need to decolonize, and I think we need to move our funding and our investments into areas that actually help people and have a future. And we need to aggressively move power and investments and platforms for speech to vulnerable communities and to black and indigenous and people of color whenever possible. Um, so one example is like looking at our public spending, like a lot of people have been doing recently with police forces and, and making sure that we're spending things that actually make our lives better and that make our communities complete and equal and stop spending on things that harm people. And I think that this is really important when we're looking at COVID-19 because we're putting so much money into recovery efforts and we have to really choose where are we putting that money, where are we putting our attention and our energy. Mm -hmm. um, and I think everybody really needs to stand up and to tell politicians and talk to all of your political representatives to tell them you know where to direct that energy because i have spoken to quite a few politicians and they say uh we can't do anything without massive support to change this like to do anything different from kind of the status quo they need a lot of support they need a lot of people telling them to do that i also think we need to put that decision making about where we invest into the people in the communities who are actually know what's needed um, so that we're not having people who traditionally have like money and wealth and power um, in making those decisions. So it might be that, you know, we're putting those efforts more into mm -hmm. making sure that every community has clean drinking water or cleaning up the land and the water where people are living with contamination that results from environmental racism. And I think that, that all of these things are, are intertwined. Thank you. And, and Lisa may be posing the same question to you or questions, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, uh, I, back in the fall of um, this 2019, along with some of my, um, I'm part of a research collective, uh, Michelle Kachmerick, Saguna Shankar, Rodrigo Dos Santos, are, they're also involved and we hosted a series of workshops with um, folks involved in neighborhood resilience, uh, repair initiatives, people deeply invested in um, neighborhood and community organizing. And the idea was to have a series of workshops around the climate crisis with these individuals who are involved in 
but also earthquake preparedness, like other kinds of um, disasters that are quite interconnected with our ability to uh, respond in ways that don't leave certain folks out of the response, which is, um, we see this all the time. Um, and through those workshops, the folks who came forward were talking about racism, the colonialism, um, uh, problems with capitalism, like they're doing community work and they're well, well informed on the kind of global systems that are harming their communities. Um, and, and also we were looking forward towards, you know, next steps and how can we work together. And I think um, librarians and libraries have a huge role to play in that um, space of how do we move forward. And um, I, I look forward to joining with all of you and more folks as we as we attempt to do that. I also wanted to I, I forgot to mention this earlier, and I'm going to use this opportunity to mention that this um, over the summer, Luann Freund, the director of my school, and I were teaching a class um, that we're making up as we go along a uh, seminar course for our mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, MLIS and MAS dual students who are um, interested in information in times of crisis. So it's a course that's recognizing that we are in COVID-19, but there's also the climate crisis. There's also a crisis around racism. There's many crises and, and really thinking through the role of information professionals in both researching these, um, preparing for them, responding to them. And um, I, I just, you know, if, if folks are out there who are doing something that they would like to share with those um, students and your fu future, and many of them are your current colleagues, um, please get in touch because it's, um, it just started last, this week, it started Monday. So we have a lot mm -hmm. of um, learning to do together. But I think that there's a growing recognition that librarians in particular have, a, have roles to play um, in helping communities research, prepare for, and respond to the many crises that are facing us. And also some of the, the things that are forcing those crises forward. Um, they all have historical roots. They didn't arise from nowhere. Mm -hmm. Right. Thanks, Lisa. Recognizing the role of librarians, and I love it that you're involved in, in the education of the new upcoming librarians. Um, Helen, did you want to add um, anything related to community action? Just, uh, just one thing, and that is that I, I've heard people talk late recently about inevitability, and just to point out that like the systems that we have with their inequality and their injustice um, and the degradation of our world, they're not inevitable. You know, they, they came to be out of choices, and where we go from here is up to us. Like, we have choices that we have to make right now, and so those choices are really important. Thank you. I'm, I'm sadly looking at the clock because um, we have the panelists have so much to say, um, but we're closing in uh, towards the end. Um, before we leave the community action section, do any of you, uh, do any of the panelists want to add anything? Allison, yeah. Can I just say really quickly that um, library work is excellent. Uh, preparation for community organizing. Um, mm. I was really pleasantly surprised to find that a lot of the skills or the lo a lot of the things I needed to do to organize a climate strike were just like organizing a library program with public participation. <laughs> <laughs> so like you, if you feel like you want to get involved, you have, as a library worker, you have a lot of skills already that will really make a contribution. David? Um, I just wanted to add that um, I think as you know, library professionals, that it's important to listen to our communities and to be aware of their needs. Um, I don't think we should have any kind of agenda going forward uh, with uh, our uh, brothers and sisters and you know, uh, communities um, where we live. Um, we need to ask them, what do you need from us? And then you need to follow through. Um, Sounds like somebody's at the door. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, maybe moving on to then uh, concluding our session. This is a question we have, I think, for all of us to think about, and that's how as individuals we can push for this um, system-wide change, that society-level change that um, we've been addressing. 
And um, so from our panelists then, what, what suggestions do you have? And maybe um, I will start with Allison. I think um, just making some noise politically, like how do politicians get feedback from their constituents? They need to hear from you by a phone call, by email, by requesting a meeting, et cetera. So just communicating that this is important. Like they're people too. It takes a lot of courage for them to stand up to, um, you know, the powers that be, uh, lobbyists, the big political system, et cetera. So they need to hear from you that this is important so that they have the courage to do that. Mm -hmm. And David? Oh, well, the first thing that comes to mind is um, being media savvy. So um, I think we take for granted that uh, the media in North America and around the world is being decimated. Uh, local news is uh, kind of going away in the way that, you know, we, that it was 10, 20, 30 years ago, right? So um, use your librarian skills to do research and research the issues in your community um, that matter to you and share that information with the media. Often they're understaffed, uh, don't have capacity to do really hard hitting uh, investigations like they used to. Uh, so I think there's a role for us to play um, that would be very beneficial uh, to society. And Lisa, what would you suggest for individuals uh, to do to push for system level change? Um, all of the above. And <laughs> <laughs> although just refer referencing back to where I started at the beginning of this session, um, Daniel Heath Justice's words about holding each other up or holding each other accountable. Um, and I worry sometimes I've noticed a change in the last few years in some of my classes where um, students are very quick to point out when they, they, they don't hear the territorial acknowledgement that they were expecting to hear or they feel that someone was misgendered. And the way that those conversations are going, sometimes what happens is kind of an attack on the person who might have made the misstatement or the mistake. Um, mm -hmm. and, and those those instances need to be, we need to pay attention to these things and we need to pay attention to our actions around climate and who's in the room and whose voices are being heard. But we also need to support each other as we all learn and, and move through these crises together. So um, I would just return back to um, uh, Dr. Justice's words of, mm -hmm. you know, yes, hold each other accountable, but do it in a way that supports people in their own learning, um, if you can. That's, yeah, thank yeah. you. And Helen? Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, talking about it and, and acting in ways that other people can see, just talking about it changes culture and it makes it more acceptable to talk about it and that, that makes it more mm -hmm. acceptable to act. And acting in visible ways, it's a lot like talking about it. It encourages other people to act and to see that they can make changes too. And it shows leaders everywhere that we want things to change. And I would also love to see us lift scientists up into leadership like we have with our public health officials so that we're hearing about this crisis like accurately and often and so that we can all learn. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And the four of you are so inspiring to, to, uh, for us to know that we can also um, take some action. So our final question is um, really for one for each of you just to share either a resource, a thinker, a place or an organization um, that you'd recommend. Um, and I'll start with David. Uh, right now I've been reading uh, Hiding in Plain Sight, The Invention of Donald Trump and the Erosion of America by Sarah Kenzior. Uh, she has a podcast called Gaslit Nation, which is excellent. If you haven't heard about it. Um, it's a very political book, yes, but it helps, uh, it's helping me understand how we got to where we are, both with the climate crisis um, and, you know, uh, mm -hmm. political crises around the world. Um, and also it, it has a little bit of a roadmap for the future of how, um, you know, scarce resources are going to be bought up and sold uh, to us and how that will have an impact on all of us. Um, so it's kind of an intense read, but I think it's an important read. And um, I hope there are some of uh, 
her uh, predictions um, don't come true, but um, mm -hmm. it, it's kind of a, a sobering reality, which gives a little bit of a history lesson on how we got where we are. Thanks. And Lisa, any recommendations? Yeah. Um, anything by Kim Lawson, who's a Heltzuk scholar and UBC librarian. Her master's thesis from 2004, mm -hmm. Precious Fragments, is a must read for all information professionals, um, particularly those who live in this part of the world. And Helen? Um, actually, I would say that uh, Twitter is a, a major venue. It could be problematic too, but it, it is a major venue for climate scientists and activists to share their work and to do public organizing. Um, so I would recommend, say, following Mary Anise Heglar and Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, um, and just any local leaders uh, that you might be able to find that are working on any issues related to social justice or climate action locally, mm -hmm. just to be connected in with what's happening. Thanks. And Allison, last suggestion from you. I'm going to go with an organization, and I'm going to say Citizens Climate Lobby Canada. Um, it's a really um, time efficient way to make a difference. They're very well organized. They have these manageable um, things that they send out monthly, kind of a checklist of things that people can do. And they're great at providing support and education and up, uplifting people to um, to make their voices heard and they're very politically savvy too. So if you want a, a place to start with um, great people that are well organized and efficient, that's a good place to, to check out. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. Um, and, and just a reminder of the, the BCLA climate uh, crisis list serve because um, as a little perk for joining the list, we're going to be sending out um, some more resources that uh, can help you understand the crisis better and how to take action. And um, with that, I'd just like to thank our panelists. Um, I'd like to thank my colleague Mayu, who has been working behind the scenes, helping a little bit too with moderating. And, um, and really to BCLA, for, um, we were so sad when the conference was canceled. So um, really thrilled that we were able to, to go ahead with this session. So thank you. And I'll turn it back to Annette. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Lisa, David, Allison, Sally, and Mayu behind the scenes. Um, yours is a really fabulous contribution to the BC uh, conference, summer conference. Uh, it means a lot to have sessions that are relevant and important to our community um, and those that are so future focused uh, as, as the session that you presented uh, is. Let me also um, echo today's panelists and urge our members uh, to join the BCLA uh, climate change list. One of the things, one of the additional things you're going to see on this list uh, is information about a project, uh, about a climate focused project currently being mounted by the BC Libraries Cooperative, Interlink, the SFU mm -hmm. Center for Dialogue, and BCLA. Mm -hmm. And I think that information, as long as as well as some of the information noted in our presentation today, really forms a, a very good infrastructure for all of our learning. So to the panelists today, it's been a real pleasure to host you. Thank you for extending this conversation. And if you're watching, if you're someone who's watching this in a recorded version, then I ask you to please visit the BCLA website. This is at www.bclaconnect.ca and there you're going to find a lot more information on other sessions that we are recording and mounting as part of the summer project, the summer, um, uh, the summer conference. So thanks again. Um, hope to see you next time. Thank you.